Yeah, yeah. And, and, and did you donate ahead of time too? Oh, yes. You guys are here early, so it's when they were doing their third episode, they wanted to do something a little more professional, a little more dramatic. Uh, they either knew or knew of Vic Mignogna. Oh, I'm glad this thing's made a wall. Gee, you didn't say that when it was a hot August day. No, no, it was different. Hi, guys. Hey. Hello. Welcome, welcome. What a great group. I what I like to do is play a little sizzle reel. It's uh, clips from all of the episodes. They're all, and I'm going to turn things over to Vic in just a second. Vic was the creator, the executive producer. And in case you can't tell, he was Captain Kirk. No. No. <laughs> I found this outside. I just put it on. I, I don't know who it belongs to, but I'm glad yeah. Nothing gives us more joy than to share it with people for the first time. Uh, to watch people's eyes light up when those doors open and they feel like they're a kid again. And we are about to give you a dream that you never imagined when you were young that you would ever get to do. Enjoy and take it all in. You can't take it all in. You're gonna wanna come back. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and it's only been 6,000 times that I've been here. And it still thrills me every time. The first room you're, we're gonna take you in would normally be at the other end of the corridor. What you're gonna walk through is within inches of the original footprint, of the original soundstage. We know that because there are diagrams of the soundstage online, like bird's eye view of the layout of the soundstage. Star Trek pioneered a lot of technology, futuristic technology. Things that they couldn't do in the mid to late 60s, but they envisioned that one day you would be able to do that. One of those things was doors that would open when you walked up to them, right? <laughs> Automatically. <laughs> Hopefully, right? <laughs> um, and that's no big deal now. It happens at every grocery store, every Target, every Walmart. It's everywhere. But back then, they didn't have that technology. They just envisioned that it would be in the future. So what they did have, though, was a guy like our dear Dan right here backstage pulling ropes and opening the doors whenever he got the cue from the other side of the sets to open the doors. So magically they would open when the actors walked up to them, hopefully. Hopefully he doesn't miss his cue, right? And then Shatner gets his nose flattened. So our cue anywhere, anytime on this set that we needed the doors open was very simply doors. doors. Ready? So you're going to give them the cue and in we'll go. Doors. Go on in. Is this beautiful or what? Now I'll tell you something. When you were walking in here, if you were if you were shooting your camera like this guy is right here, that thing looks like it's 50 feet deep, doesn't it? That that core looks like it's 40 or 50 feet deep. Now if you get up close though, with the naked eye, you can see that it's only 12 feet deep which is exactly like the original series. The schematics show this exact layout. Now what they were using, they were employing a, te a technique called forced perspective. It's a very simple concept. The concept is the further away something is from you, the smaller it looks. Now this is the largest set uh, of the whole soundstage, but not because of its horizontal space, but because it's two stories high. Can you imagine building a monster like this? Like, it was, it was a real challenge. In fact, we, uh, building engineering was a stretch goal for our series. One of the recurring themes we're gonna talk about through the entire tour is the number one priority for the original series of Star Trek, when they were shooting that series, came down to one word, money. Star Trek was the most expensive show on television. Did you know that? It was the most expensive show of the time. Why? Right? Like, what's the big whoop, right? I mean, why does it cost so much money? Well, let's talk about it for a minute. Back in the 60s, what were the most television shows were what? Westerns. Cowboys, right, Westerns, right? Bonanza, Big Valley, Gunsmoke. What do you need to make a Western? Horses. Horses, plenty of horses in the world, right? Plenty of ranches, plenty of Western clothing. 
What do you need to make a cop show? City streets, right? But now think about Star Trek. Nothing exists. Nothing. You have to build everything. What do they wear in the 23rd century? What kind of ships do they fly? What kind of weapons do they fire? What kind of food do they eat? What kind of, you know, I mean, you can already see the budget, right? Just growing. In fact, I'll tell you a little secret. A lot of you know that Lucille Ball, Lucy, uh, she was the one that brought Star Trek to television. These gold spheres around here. You know what they are? This is this is really what they were. Firephone? Huh? Firephone? No. <laughs> it's a kid's ball. ball. It's literally a kid's ball. What other episode did you see them in? <laughs> Devil in the Dark with the Horda, the creature that tunneled through the rocks, and they stumbled across its nursery and its eggs. You'll buy us a hundred more balls from all the grand. I want to be able to get those low angle shots. You can see that arching ceiling, dramatic arch ceiling behind the actor. So he started to try to build one of them. One of those arches, just one. I was here, me and Will. We were building it right here on the floor. And we built it, and then we tried to pick it up. And we're like, crap, crap, crap. The thing weighed, I don't know. 100 pounds, 200 pounds? And we thought, well, first of all, that's one. And we need five, and all the panels in between. If you tried to build that the conventional way, you'd never be able to get it up there. It would weigh too much. And if you got it up there, you'd have to secure it to the ceiling somehow and pray that it doesn't fall, because if it did, it would destroy anyone or anything underneath it. So while we were lamenting, that we weren't gonna be able to build the ceiling, we met the phone guy. And we drew up these plans, and he pulled up here with a flatbed truck two days later with these sections, and you and I can carry it right out of here. It's amazing. He was very, very helpful. All righty, let's do this. Give him the cue. Doors. <laughs> <laughs> Stop at the red line for me, if you would. Is this gorgeous or what? It's amazing. It never gets old. It just never gets old. Um, what you're about to walk through is, like I mentioned earlier, within inches of the original soundstage. Now, somebody's probably thinking, well, how could he know that, smarty pants? He wasn't, he, he wasn't there. And that none of us were there in the late 60s when they were shooting the this, this series and building these sets. That's true. So how do you know how big to make everything? You could take a guess, right? But you may be wrong. Come back here and just turn around to take all your shots from here. This is the classic camera angle that you remember from the original series. You're like, why would a grown man be so in love with fabric? <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because it doesn't exist. <laughs> back in the original series, back in the 60s, this stuff was everywhere. <clears throat> they, found, they found it, they liked it, they bought it in several colors and used it for a lot of different things. Unfortunately, it's just gone. The fabric is long gone. So when we were building all these sets, I was looking for all of these things that I knew we were going to need. So I'm scouring the internet looking for this kind of fabric. And at some point I thought, you know, Vic, you got a lot to build. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to worry about. Don't get fixated, right? Don't get tunnel vision on fabric. You're probably only going to make one episode anyway. You might be able to make a good handful of these. Let's come off the money and have this custom woven. You can't have a textile company make this. Make, oh, we, we just need 10 yards. Well... Good luck with that, right? If they're going to set up all their machines to make this, what was it, 100 yard minimum? Yeah, well, we didn't need 100 yards. We weren't going to, you know, put it down on the, on the carpet and, 
in the corridor. So we, we used it on the beds. We used it different places that they used it. Another fun story about sick bay, again, the technology. This bio bed, you guys remember, if you ever watched the original series, those arrows would go boom, 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 boom. And it was supposed to be reading your vital signs. The way this technology was supposed to work was this device would scan your body and put your vital signs on the screen. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, but Gene Roddenberry wanted Star Trek grounded in science. He literally had a company, an R&D company, called DeForest Research, <coughs> and their sole job was to vet the scripts. He would send them the scripts to episodes and say, okay, what's plausible? Is this plausible? And if so, how is it plausible? However, in 1966, they couldn't do this. <laughs> they could imagine it. So you know how they made those arrows work? The same way they made the doors work. <laughs> there was a guy behind this wall moving those arrows up and down by hand. So to show you, specific to the room, this is an example of Dr. McCoy's scanner. This is actually the scanner we used on Star Trek Continues. It's just a motor with a battery. This one happens if you're, if you're quiet, it'll make noise. You can hear it. The, the real one did not make noise. It just made that sound of the, the motor. The handle is made from a Sears screwdriver. Sears and Robot. <laughs> yeah, 1966. See, another perfect example. You just find stuff laying around, you stick it together, you make something new. And that's like, that's like the epitome of creativity, right? If you're $400 million to throw at a movie, you just build anything, right? But if you don't, now you've got to use your imagination. Hey, hey, hey. How was that? Oh, it's a arrow sign I put outside. Ah. The, the tape came off, so I put the tape on it. I love the idea. Ice cream. <coughs> Thank you. Is that beautiful? That's yes. cool. Could you ever imagine when you were 10 years old that you'd be standing in the transporter room? No. And I'll tell you what, once again, from back here, you guys want to get the classic shot. Yeah. From back here, you see everything. That's great. That's a great shot. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, what do you think these actually are? And she said, what, are they like microwave? They do. They look like the microwave plates that you put stuff on its side. Huge microwave. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big microwave. They look like cool lights. Sorry? They look like cool lights. Now you're talking. Now you got it. You know what they are? They're lenses for movie lights. They're big. Fresnel. You ever heard that word? It's a, it's a French company that makes lights. Fresnel. F-R-E-S-N-E-L. Fresnel lights. And they're still in existence. Now, if you're a film production studio in Los Angeles making a TV show in the 60s, guess what? You got lots of these in LA. And your supervisor walks in one day and hands out scripts and says, okay, every guy, everybody, take a look at this. This is a new show we've been hired to do the effects for called Star Trek. And you're standing there looking through, paging through this script going, Captain Kirk beams down. What the hell is beaming down? I mean, for us, that's common. Now, everybody knows what that means. Now, they didn't even know what it meant. What, it looked, what would it look like? How do you even accomplish that, right? Oh, the, uh, the ship fires phasers. What are phasers? So all of the things that this show was calling for, many of them had never been done before. Somebody had to figure out how to do them with the technology available, and that's the key. This is how they did it in the 60s. Let's pretend that you are, what's your, what's your name? Tamara. What's your last name? Dwyer. Dwyer? This is Admiral Dwyer, and she's getting ready to beam aboard the Enterprise, okay? So, I want you to stand over here for a minute for me. Okay, so, this is how they did it. The camera would be rolling, and the director would say, you ready? Yep. Action. And some guy backstage would flash these lights on and off in a sequence, and then the director would say, hold. Admiral, step up there, please. Camera's still rolling, by the way. Step right into the middle. And hit it. 
she would hold very still and hold. And she would step down. Welcome, Admiral. I'm Captain Kirk. Welcome to the end. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Now, what do you have? You have two pieces of footage, right? What's the only difference between those two pieces of footage? Her there, not there. In one, she's there, one, she's not. Escape. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Exactly, good eye. They like the way it looks. So they, they use it a lot. Did you notice the sign said briefing room two? No. You didn't? Or you did? That's to create the illusion that there is a Exactly. Just by putting a number two on that plate, you you just explode a kid's imagination. Oh my gosh, there are more than one on this ship. It must be huge. I love that. Any, uh, did anybody notice something missing, strangely, chairs. from this room? Chairs. Yeah, exactly. Chair, where are the chairs? In the bridge, probably. Probably. Because, again, how do you save money? Well, if you want to save money, you don't build 25 chairs. Because you're only shooting in one room at a time. So why do you need chairs in the briefing room if you're shooting on the bridge? Right? So we did exactly the same thing. We built... 10 or 12 of the really nice Star Trek chairs, and when they were, whenever they were, we were shooting in here, they would be around this table. And then we'd break for lunch, and somebody would move them to the bridge for the next scene, or take a couple of them to engineer. Star Trek is post World War II, right? <coughs> so there were a fleet of aircraft carriers that were in service, actually in service when Star Trek was shot. You know what some of their names were? The Yorktown, the Lexington, the Constitution, the Farragut, the Enterprise. There was literally an aircraft carrier while they were shooting Star Trek called the Enterprise. In other words, apparently the starships were meant to be kind of like the aircraft carriers of the future. Pretty cool. Well, I didn't know who was going to wear this this soon. I have one in my car. <laughs> You yeah, look, you look we, good, buddy. We look agreed we were going to wear them, and then he shows up looking <laughs> normal. <laughs> I never look normal, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> now, for those of you that don't know, if you don't mind, why don't you tell them your your uh, connection to classic well, Star Trek? Uh, my, my father was James Dew and Scotty from the original Star Trek. And uh, I've been in a couple of the movies. I'm the transporter chief in the new J.J. Abrams movies. But my the most exciting thing was when Vic asked me to be Scotty for Star Trek Continues. And as I told him, it you know it completely changed my life. It really did. I mean, you know, just just walking in here today and seeing these sets again. We spent so much time in here, and it's it's just so much fun. And so I'm so grateful that we it's here. We could come back and see this. I'm very grateful that you guys can experience what we've experienced. Yes. And it's uh, it's just really 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 something. Tell us what you got. Yeah, here are the details. So uh, I, I brought a treasure that I'm going to donate to Ray. So this is one of the original coffee servers that we saw in Star Trek. It's from a company called Gavis in Sweden. Uh, they were uh, European. There's a lot of European things on Star Trek. So I had a couple extra in my collection, and I'm going to uh, donate this one wow. to the studio so that as they shoot fan films, they can be authentic. Uh, coffee cups. Here's a vintage 1960s coffee cup. This is what they actually use. This is from a company called Spyro Cup. There's a couple scenes where Captain Kirk is putting it back, and you can read if you zoom in. Styro Cup. They <laughs> literally just took. You thought I was a nerd. Yeah. <coughs> well, co coffee right 1960s. So right. Right. It's right. <laughs> kind of a story. funny story. So uh, my, we went to the set occasionally. Yeah, of course, I was. I had my I had a twin brother. We were this big. And uh, he would never let us go, like, when he's actually filming, right? He, we were too noisy, we were too crazy. And he would say, you can either stay in my dressing room, or you can go, uh, you know, hang out in the shuttle craft. We're like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't, there was no real choice for us. It's like, we're going to the shuttle craft, right? But this one day he brought us, and it was a special day, because it was, they were filming, well, I'll, I'll get back to that. But he, so he says, you guys be in, go in, you know, into the shell crap. He goes, I'll be back and whatever, you can stay here. And he goes, do not leave this shell crap. And we're like, okay, <laughs> yeah, no problem, you know. <laughs> and so he's off and he's gone. He's gone for a little while. We decide, of course, 
precocious little twins. I had to go to the studio where we know that my dad wasn't filming. And we're, we're walking around and we're, we're opening things and all over the place. And, you know, looking all over the place. And we see this, this, this sort of cabinet up there. And my, my brother gets on my shoulder and, you know, and, and opens it. And a thousand tribbles fall on us. <laughs> you obviously know what episode that was, right? And that's why he wanted us there, because he thought, this is really special, right? And, but we freaked out, we freaked out, we just, we ran as fast as we could back to the show, and we get there, and not five minutes passed, and my dad comes in, he goes, you're such good boys. <laughs> I said, if you only knew. but true story, I told my dad this, this story, probably, I'm gonna say 25 years later, and, he wouldn't talk to me for days. <laughs> he was so mad. And I said, really? I don't want to wax religious, but we saw so many providential things happen in our series. Things that you would have never imagined worked out so perfectly. At the end of the mirror episode, at the end of our third episode, this, this script said that Captain Kirk gets put on the shuttlecraft with the handful of officers that are still loyal to him. Bad Kirk. Evil Kirk, yeah. Mirror Kirk. Well, we didn't have a shuttlecraft. We didn't even have anything like a shuttlecraft. We did not know who Adam Schneider was. Didn't even didn't even occur to us about the, the actual shuttlecraft. And I think it was you. Dave came to me one day and said, hey, uh, this guy owns the shuttlecraft. He bought it and restored it, donated it to Space Center Houston. And he said if you happen to need it, if you ever want to shoot with it, he could probably make that happen. And this guy didn't know that we were in the middle of production for an episode that ends with us in the hangar deck using the shuttlecraft. So we flew, took a skeleton crew to, uh, to Houston put a giant green screen around the, the actual shuttlecraft and were able to shoot with the original shuttlecraft from the series. I mean like climb up in it, you know what I mean? And interact with it physically um, on camera. And it was amazing, it was amazing. Um, here's a fun fact. Even this shuttlecraft that they built for the series was only three quarter scale. They decided that it photographed just fine at three-quarter scale, but it wasn't. But it didn't cost as much money as it would have to build it to full limited scale. budget in the original Star Trek. Oh yeah. yeah. And notice how everything is already in existence. Remember how we talked about saving money? Everything he just laid out here are things that were already made. So they just repurposed them in some way, and that's how they save money. Yeah, the triple was made from my dad's dead cat. Guys, the next room we're going to go into is right here. Now, remember what I told you about this side of the of the corridor, right? Remember how I told you that it was it would have been like the lab and Dr. McCoy's office? Well, we didn't need those things. Right now, it's currently set up as auxiliary control. So when you walk through this door and look to your left, that's auxiliary control. So as I said, this area here is auxiliary control. So from back here, looking in that way, that's auxiliary control. But again, as I said, we use this area for a lot of things. When it was uh, Aaron Gray's office, see the screen behind me? Notice that it's white here with the names of the ships that were still in service instead of being black like it was in auxiliary control. Tiny little changes. We put a solid wall here, covered up all this stuff, put a solid wall here with a window in it and a green screen behind it, which allows us to project the star base in the background. All of this area here, this wasn't built yet, right? This, was, this wasn't until the third episode. For, for our second episode, we needed guest quarters. So we built this area. There was a bed right over there. Notice this white table. This is one of those tables that would be used to turn the briefing room into the rec room. In fact, you saw in the in the teaser reel where I was fighting Lou Ferrigno, right? You saw that where I kicked him? Good joke. 
That was right here, literally. He deserved it. Yeah, he, are, he deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that comfortable, trust me. <laughs> Is that everybody? Now you're standing in the crew quarters. Now I didn't call it Captain Kirk's quarters. I didn't call it Spock's room. Because this is everybody's room. Again, how do you save money? You build one room and then you just redecorate. You just change it up with different trinkets on the counter, light it a little different, put some different paintings on the wall, move stuff around a little bit. Like when it was Kirk's room, the table was here, the bed was over here, but when it was Spock's quarters, the bed was over here, and the table jutted out from this <coughs> section here. Now this is not Captain Kirk's room, or Spock's. In fact, did you notice the nameplate? What did the nameplate say when you walked in? Captain Robert April. Now, for those of you who don't know, we wanted an actor to be able to climb up there and get the classic shots of them up in there. There's a platform at the top that, uh, that the camera would sit on, and you could climb right up in it. Now, anybody remember when you were little the, the, uh, the blueprints to the Enterprise? Anybody ever have those? Mm -hmm. or, Still yeah. do. Or the technical manual it had all that stuff. Still do. Well, did you do you remember that there were these Jeffries tubes all over the ship? They were access conduits for all of the different systems. There wasn't just one. They were everywhere. But they didn't build a lot of them for the show. <laughs> so the entire sound stage was laid out exactly the way you just were. Oh, remember how we talked about where engineering would have normally been? This <laughs> is where engineering would have been in the original soundstage. The bridge was the only set that was not connected to the, uh, to the rest of the sets. All of these rooms were connected to the corridor, exactly the way you just walked through. Which is also really cool because you could follow an actor right out of the transporter room into the corridor. <laughs> Careful <laughs> the steps going down over the little tree. Oh yeah. Wow. Where I belong. Yeah, there's a there's a branch here. You just want to go straight in here. Is this incredible or what? Yeah. <coughs> Going straight for the captain's chair. <laughs> Is that right? You guys, let me tell you it's something special. Uh, you are some of the first to see it. When we shot Star Trek Continues, we didn't have a V screen. Uh, we intended to build it. We had every intention of building it. But every episode called for a new set. And that became the priority. So this whole section here, this platform and the view screen up, didn't exist. It was all wide open which was really great for shooting, right? You could get big, huge shots of the bridge. But the neutral zone raised the money to build this front section. And William Smith, who designed the floor plans for uh, engineering, also designed this for us to build. That view screen is four feet by seven feet. That's exactly what the original soundstage, the original bridge, uh, view screen was. There's only one television that fits perfectly into that space, and it's a hundred inch flat pan. So a couple of us decided that we were going to spend the money and buy one and donate it to the neutral zone. So what you're looking at 
is a 100-inch television. So not only is it accurate to the size of the view screen, but it's an actual television. And we had Mark Bell, our, uh, our VFX supervisor from Star Trek Continues, create this loop that looked like you're orbiting a planet. He also created one with just the stars going by. So it kind of looks like you're flying through space. But what's really cool about it is, if you were going to shoot a, a fan film here, you could interact with the view screen. It wouldn't have to be a green screen. It, you wouldn't have to project something in it later. You could actually put it on the screen. These are the actual Star Trek chairs, okay? But even these chairs, in an effort to save money, were just plain molded plastic chairs. Cheap molded plastic chairs. Same thing with the captain's chair. The chair itself, the upholstered armrest chair itself in the middle, was made by a company called Madison. Next opening, I'll talk about the buttons. So I actually own the original button cluster from the Enterprise. Uh, the William Shatner, you know, jettison the pod. Yes, the actual chair is in the Mopop Museum in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and they don't keep it on display always, but uh, when they do put it on display, the, the right side doesn't look quite the same. Uh, Vic and I were involved in a restoration project with Will Smith, who was the art director for most of Star Trek Continues. You know, the original navigation helm console is still in existence. It's owned by the same museum. It's in pretty bad shape. And uh, they hired Will to restore it for a traveling exhibition. So we got to go to Seattle to have a look at it, crawl underneath it, look at the paint that existed still from the cage. And uh, it's made out of two by fours. And uh, the targeting scanner that's in the middle uh, with the yellow disc, that actually comes from a, a World War II destroyer. But our navigation helm console is within an inch of the original. And that was just the people who made this originally just guessing, you know, based on their own clips. Now, remember we told you that we had a, just a few of the real these switches? These are the act, these are real. So, we figured if we Oh, that's that one. Oh, not that one. <laughs> um, so, this guy gets to turn on the proximity alert. He can turn on a station. I don't know what the hell that is. It looks like a fish finder to me. And then, you know, you don't want to leave Sulu out, so... He gets to turn his station on. He even gets to turn the astrogator on. Yeah, One of the first shots was, I, I remember, you and I were in the turbo lift right here. The camera was out here waiting for us to enter the scene, right? And, and you and I were behind these doors waiting for them to open. And we're looking at each other yeah. in our uniforms. We're like, are we really doing this? Is this like, real? this is at the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. Is it, are we going to be able to pull this off? I don't even know. But uh, I remember standing in this little turbo lift behind this door. With, it was one with of the friends. vignettes, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. Uh, yes, it was. Yeah, before we ever shot any episodes, I thought it would be a neat idea to create a couple of short vignettes, basically introducing you to these actors in these roles so that it wasn't so jarring when you actually watched the episodes. One of them picks right up where the last episode of Star Trek, who knows what it was? Turnabout Intruder. Turnabout Intruder. Um, they walked into the turbo lift down in the corridor. Oh, that one, actually, at the end of the corridor. And that was the end of Star Trek. That was the last time you ever saw it. So we picked up right where they left off. We cre cre recreated that last scene, and then we walked into the turbo lift, and then suddenly... <coughs> We just continue, and you're in the turbo lift with You know, the guy that owns this building, he likes Star Trek, but he still expects the rent every month. Can you believe it? The nerve of the guy. The utility company. They expect the electricity bill to be paid every month. So there are costs that are involved in keeping this standing so that people can come from Kentucky, Puerto Rico. We've had people from all over the country and even internationally come because this is a dream for a lot of people. And the only thing the neutral zone wants to do is keep it alive for people to enjoy. So please be generous. You can join the Patreon, which is a, a website. It's a, it's a service that you sign up for and just automatically will deduct 50 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month. You'd never even miss it. But imagine if 
200 people did that. You know what I mean? Did it pay for the rent and help keep this place afloat? Could you even imagine having to tear this down? Mm-hmm. Like, I can't even conceive of that. Right. Like, that can't, that can't even happen. That, that could never We're happen. We're hoping that we can be doing this 10 years from now. Yeah. And, and yeah. Without, without support, we can't. Yeah. So please be generous. And the first to be. Where's it? You met the captain. Well, hello there. No, I missed it. Goes nowhere, does nothing. <laughs> it's in every single Star Trek show. That's pretty good. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Goes nowhere, does nothing. Hmm. 